Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, as Sarah said, I'm Anthony Cerulli, and I'm the director of the Center for South Asia here at UW-Madison. I'd like to just begin with a quick um, land acknowledgement that the U University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejop since time immemorial. And since uh, Let's see here. Uh, and since Sarah um, already mentioned a couple, a uh, couple of very important things coming forward, I'll get right to um, the introduction of our speaker today. With one exception, I just want to say a word to all of you who are currently in our intensive South Asian summer language classes. And I hope things are off to a good start. That you're learning a lot and finding ways to manage your time, which isn't always easy in an intensive summer language class, especially in a place um, you know, wherever you are. Uh, you know, if you're in Madison, it's a nice place to be, but I know we're coming from all over the place and studying virtually now. So you're probably all, I hope, in wonderful places, and uh, that can pose its challenges for time management, but I'm sure you're figuring it out. But I hope you're generally having a good experience uh, in Sosley this summer. I attended Sosley, I did the math uh, this morning. I attended Sosley 20 years ago this summer, which I was not happy to, to realize, but um, it was a very good experience. I was here for uh, an intensive uh, Hindi and Urdu uh, course. And I recall being simultaneously exhilarated and challenged and tired. And as the days went by and the weeks went by, I was also very rewarded by all the effort that I put in. And I hope that you have a very similar experience that I did. So thank you for being here this afternoon for what's going to be a very exciting presentation with a colleague of mine here at UW-Madison, Dr. Tani Tidwell. Tani is a biocultural anthropologist and Tibetan medical doctor, currently serving as a postdoctoral research associate in UW-Madison's Center for Healthy Minds. Her research facilitates connections across Western science and Tibetan medicine. Uh, she got her PhD from Emory University where her doctoral work focused on embodiment in textual oral transmission and perceptual techniques in different diagnostics. So she's working across very interesting medical traditions and sciences, uh, both in Tibet and in the bio, biomedical world. Tawny's research and medical practice investigates things like the body-mind relationship that's foundational to health, to facilitate health, and she uses biocultural and Tibetan medical paradigms of well-being in order to do that. And in addition to her work at the Center for Healthy Minds and her private practice, she does collaborative work on Tibetan medicine with a team at Emory University who partners with Mense Kong in India, Qinghai Provincial Tibetan Medical Hospital in Amdo, and several smaller clinics in Tibet. She's also an affiliated researcher with the University of Vienna, where she advises the Austrian Science Fund project, Soa Rigpa and Buddhist Ritual. She really has an incredible range of expertise and interests. I've just touched upon a few of them. Uh, so we're in for a real treat as she gives us a talk this afternoon called Tibetan Medical Paradigms for the SARS-CoV-2 Pandemic. Tracking COVID-19 Cases and its Soa Rigpa Etiologies. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Tidwell. Thank you for being here and um, let's get on with it. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. That was a very kind introduction. It's just a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I was speaking with uh, Anthony earlier today, um, or earlier, just a few minutes ago, talking about how when I first heard about Sosley, I was at uh, Stanford University um, trying to scrap together a program to study, to study Tibetan language. And I heard about this dream program where you actually had um, kind of it all prepared for you. And I think back in the day, we had to kind of scrap even the textbook together. So I'm just really thrilled um, that all of you have chosen this opportunity to take part in. And I just think it's a really... Uh, a wonderful, wonderful program. So um, I'm going to switch over and I'm going to go ahead and share this screen from another uh, non-technical technical method today. So I just want to thank um, all the organizers, South, the South Asian Summer Language Program, SASE, the Center for South Asia, um, particularly um, Dr. Anthony Cerulli as the faculty director, um, Dr. Sarah Beckham as associate director, and the fantastic work that Tyler, Lara, and Marissa Beauty put together in organizational and tech support. So thank you um, so much. So today I'm gonna be uh, presenting on Tibet medical paradigms for the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And within that, I'm gonna be looking a little bit at the etiological perspective. So how Tibet medicine understands SARS 
SARS-CoV-2 and the disease manifestation of it in COVID-19, the responses that occurred in Tibet to the outbreak of COVID-19 and how that provided us in North America with an important context that shaped um, the work that we're doing here, tracking mild and medium severity cases treated by Tibetan medicine exclusively. So I also want to um, thank our sponsors of this research. Um, it's been a really a uh, wonderful uh, big team effort. So we've received funding from the Cultural um, Culture, Mind and Brain Network at the Foundation of Psychocultural Research. We've also um, the International Association for the Study of Traditional Asian Medicines, Arizona Friends of Tibet, the Global Health Research Foundation of Stanford and the Kunde Institute. And then our institutional partners at Dartmouth, Stanford and University of Minnesota, as well as um, my colleagues at the American Tibet Medical Association. So, this, this assessment of the socio-ecological conditions that gave rise to the novel SARS-CoV-2 um, novel coronavirus epidemic as understood by the Tibet medical tradition was described in the initial weeks of the outbreak by Tibet medical physician, Dr. Kenneth Yamso, accompanied by his colleague and Johns Hopkins epidemiologist, Dr. Kunja Dorji in their joint interview with Radio Free Asia. As predicted more than a thousand years ago, Today we're encountering the prophecies of a degenerate era when hitherto unknown infectious disease, toxins and environmental devastation and suffering is occurring. It's time to revisit the wisdom of our medical canon and cultivate the practices so critical at this time, compassion, wisdom, and the wish for all to be relieved from suffering. At a coincident time, Dr. Lobson Tunduk and Dr. Tashi Rupton, two Tibetan physicians residing in the United States, voiced a similar perspective in a think tank for a Tibetan online news site, the Tibet Times. The root cause of these epidemics is greed, the insatiable desire to eat varieties of food that we should not eat, to kill animals mindlessly, destroy the environment for personal gain, and amass consumption insatiably. We have created, created severe imbalance in our wor world and our ethics and compassion have deteriorated. In the months prior, colleagues on the Tibetan Plateau had articulated similar assessments. So such accounts might seem a little odd to a general public accustomed to the Euro-American tradition of biomedicine in which prognostic medical futures are not conceived, let alone theorized. And global behaviors are rarely connected to healthcare crises. The Tibetan medical tradition known as Puluk Soripa in Tibetan or the Tibetan system of healing knowledge integrally tracks these individual and societal level behaviors as consequent to life course health outcomes and experiences. The medical tradition likewise has served a large region of Asia with primary health care for several hundreds of years with clinics even today outnumbering biomedical clinics at every administrative level across an area the size of Europe. Various contemporary sources refer to the medical tradition simply as Soaripa, or the knowledge field of healing. Its related contemplative practices have gained foremost attention from biomedical research communities for their contributions to health and well being. Furthermore, pharmacological research on its formulas have demonstrated a wide range of biological activities, including anti malarial, anti cancer, antimicrobial, antiviral vascular and neuroprotective and immune and inflammation modulatory through our multi-compound, multi-target pleiotropic signatures, looking at various biological receptors that are being acted on systematically. So formulas specific to the respiratory tract with antibacterial properties have also been studied, such as GABR25, here produced as Padma28 by the Swiss company Padma Ag. So such work illustrates the relevance of this several thousand year old tradition in contemporary times, even for a condition of pandemic scale as one of our greatest modern global health crises. So as the novel coronavirus spread across China, two of the largest Tibetan regions of the Tibetan Plateau announced its first cases in Qinghai province and the Tibetan Autonomous Region. Tibetan physicians began preparing treatments for patients infected with the disease, perhaps unprecedented in Tibetan history, despite the prescience in the classical texts. SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, incited an initial major wave of epidemic level clinical preparations during the 2003 eight month outbreak with 8,100 8, cases reported in China. Though none arrived in Tibet, Tibetan physicians demonstrated an armament of medical and ritual approaches in their repertoire that would be enacted through, should the virus arrive in Tibet itself. 
The Ebola virus breakout from 2014 to 2016 in West Africa, the largest, most complex Ebola outbreak since its discovery in 1976, motivated another surge of preparations among the Tibet medical community as they faced the reality of frequent human transit between West Africa and China, stemming from tight business and aid relations and its potential pandemic threat. In this latter outbreak, physicians at the foremost Tibetan medical hospital in Eastern Tibet, Qinghai Provincial Tibetan Medical Hospital, began revisiting these key passages of root texts and key formulas indicated as part of a prophesied repertoire needed for this degenerate era of unprecedented infectious disease and environmental toxins. The Tibetan medical classic, the four medical treatises we call Gu Shi, um, with described antecedents originating as early as the seventh century of the current era and the current composition formalized in the 12th century, is the foundational text informing both the theory and practice of Tibetan medicine. Along with its elaborations and its prominent commentaries, it predicts this time when hitherto unencountered toxins and infectious diseases appear due to harm inflicted on the environment and the resulting imbalances that people would experience. The novel coronavirus that began its outbreak in December 2019 motivated this next iteration of Tibet medical preparations, revisiting, revisiting prognosticated forms of pandemic treatments. So globally, SARS-CoV-2 has now taken far more lives than the Ebola virus and the SARS outbreaks combined. Though only a couple hundred confirmed cases occurred on the Tibetan plateau in mid-February of 2020, the virus has now affected nearly every Tibetan community globally, including the first U.S. COVID-19 epicenter in Queens and Jackson Heights, New York. This is one of the densest Tibetan communities outside Tibet and India, and during this time, these communities have turned predominantly to Tibetan medicine for their therapeutic refuge. This recent epidemic has exemplified a new degree of clinical proficiency amid a global crisis. Tibetan physicians led successful health education campaigns, effective treatment protocols, and nuanced scholastic discourse. Reviving these previously textually ensconced directives targeting such virulent infectious disease. Key sections from the Tibet medical classics frame discussions and exchanges of Tibet medical physicians during the pandemic to the present. The nosological understandings of this class of infectious diseases known as Nyerim, or the virulent infectious diseases, the related causal factors and citing conditions and modes of infection for these epidemic level diseases, focusing on the category of Simbu, or these microorganisms that get out of balance in the macrocosm, and also the idea that our bodies in this degenerate age are weaker, have much more comorbidities and more susceptible to these virulent infections. Um, and baseline, uh, what Tibet medicine considers heat or chronic inflammatory conditions that provide a greater disposition to the severe effects of such pathogens. They talked about the specific characteristics, the natures and types of virulent in infections to expect during this era, the preventative measures, diagnostic signs, and then the treatment approaches should these conditions reach epidemic scale. So days after news hit the Tibetan plateau of the novel corona coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, provincial health bureaus and central Tibet medical institutions across the region launched their official protocols for prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation, and preparation for cases of infected patients to come to their provinces, counties, and townships. Senior physicians published statements, included instructing their junior colleagues on treatment protocols for this novel disease and based these on their rich textual foundations as well as their experience of several epidemics that had occurred prior in Tibetan history. Senior physicians also permeated their social media with their public health presentations, drawing on these root and commentarial passages of the text. They were integrating um, hygiene practices, social distancing guidelines, protective behaviors of covering one's mouth, and not partaking in potentially contaminated foods or places of exposure. And this is combining those recommendations and quotes with these modern public health education style visualized graphics, as well as drawings and images that fuse the Buddhist framework with these health guidelines. Professors and clinicians gave interviews and lectures describing how this disease relates to that which is described in the text, as well as the symptomology that had become public thus far related to the standard nosologies of flu-like viruses, heat and fever conditions, and the possibility of long-term consequences that would affect the brain, the lungs, the heart, and the kidneys. 
And these professional and public talks, including those by Harvard alumnus and Lhasa Tibet University Professor Yanga, and here you see UCLA Public Health PhD and Qinghai University Tibet Medical College Professor Kunjo Gyansen, it became apparent that the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 presented not only a major national health crisis, but simultaneously opened up possibilities for a new emerging public face of Soa Rigpa. And this is a stark contrast to decades earlier when you didn't have many Tibetan physicians cross-trained in biomedical discourse or clinical practice, and you certainly did not have a national government open to the contributions offered by this traditional medical system. So in this presentation, I emphasize that COVID-19 has provided an opportunity for Tibetan physicians in Tibet to come from the periphery of national discourse in China to the center and showcase the significant developments that have been achieved in restoring the educational, clinical, and professional spheres of the Tibetan medical field. It's also provided an opportunity to showcase the achievements of this repaired tradition, a tradition that has now regenerated through significant hard work and redevelopment over the last several decades through its concrete pharmaceutical contributions to care and integrative medical paradigms for supporting recoveries. So China officially classifies Tibetan medicine as quote, traditional Chinese medicine or Zhongyi, a contemporary umbrella term encompassing all its ethnic medical condition, uh, traditions, the Minzu, Yue Yi. Such policy risks absorbing Soerikpa into this larger category, making it invisible to the greater public. Yet Tibetan physicians are collectively transcending this limitation and skillfully navigating the restrictions and requirements, and sometimes these restrictions being unspoken and merely inferred, of participating in this paradigm, a paradigm in which non-participation will effectively amount to one's removal from existence, a full annihilation, so to speak. So to avoid this peril and transcend the limitations, they are building status for their tradition in this context of major public health concerns in a global era. COVID-19's pandemic has provided a critical window to track Soripa's scope and impact in China at this time. So as their expertise flooded the virtual landscape in early January, Tibet medical institutions also sent physical relief, workers and large supplies, supplies of respiratory and infectious disease medicines to affected areas in mainland China, including Wuhan. Externally worn sachets known as Nafu Gujor or the nine compound black pill, traditionally prescribed for protective qualities were also sent to regions in mainland China affected by the virus during the outbreak. Shipments launched from Lhasa Mensikong, Qinghai Provincial Tibet Medical Hospital, and various prefecture, county, and private producer, producers. Although government regulations limited acceptable relief donations to formulas meeting national good manufacturing practice standards, contributions still massed a net worth of tens of millions of renminbi. Likewise, restrictions on traditional medicine permitted in biomedical institution treatments also constrained formulas just to mild cases. Chutin, China's biggest Tibetan pharmaceutical producer, also sent its licensed formulas to Wuhan, Beijing, and its home Gansu hospitals. The losses first reported case was not until February 25th. By February 25th, Tibetan regions had significant transmission with the greatest concentration in Ganze prefecture and its far eastern Dao County particularly. Donations from plateau sources shifted to focus on local relief to Tibetan uh, to target to these Tibetan communities affected by SARS-CoV-2. Prominent private Xining physician, Jigmi Punzo, who you see here in this slide, contributed half a million renminbi or 70,000 US dollars equivalent worth of one of his national certified formulas, Red Dazi. Red Dazi is known for fighting not only respiratory infections, but also for brain inflammation and systemic inflammation, again, that affects the heart, the kidneys, and blood conditions generally. Even areas in which no reported cases occurred, physicians donated uh, protection substances such as the Nakba Gujor uh, pill and epidemic protector amulets to their local communities simultaneously providing virus education outreach and encouraging these stringent health protection measures. Despite, despite some criticism within the field, such as Southwest Minzu University professor Emeritus Tupdin Punzok, accusing Tibetan physicians of exploiting crisis to make profit on amulets and preventative substances, and claiming that mantras are meaningless during epidemics, uh, which I find kind of interesting since a lot of our work on uh, the various contemplative practices look at specific immune strengthening effects of these practices, but another topic for another day. Provincial to township level physicians and institutions liberally donated their time and resources. 
Several hospitals even provided free care to confirm cases. Now, whether Tupton Punzuk's comments incited greater charity is difficult to determine, but regardless, generosity unfolded substantially. Tibetan the Tibetan medicine industry, there we go. The Tibet medicine industry has grown significantly over the last few decades, reaching a US $1 billion production by 2018. The richness of tradition, proficiency in, um, and rigor put forth in this contemporary co context could not be demonstrated decades earlier when Tibet medicine was under heavy scrutiny from the central Chinese government to appear biomedical and non-religious. After the initial democratic reforms from 1959 to 1962 and the Cultural Revolution from 66 to 76, the period following Mao's death led to cautious expansion and legitimization efforts among Tibetan physicians. So Aruba institutions stripped any Buddhist or Tibetan cultural references from their medical curriculum and instead framed medical content in biomedical terms. In the post-reform era, state funding transformed Tibet medical institutions into partial replicas of their biomedical counterparts. For compliance, Tibetan physicians consciously reframed disease causation explanations in explicitly biomedical terms. Recent decades, however, have seen a new wave of central government support for ethnic minority medical traditions and explicit legislation supporting their role in combating common diseases, chronic conditions, and even epidemics. Xi Jinping's advocacy for a traditional culture and integration of ancient Chinese philosophy has created a rhetorical distance to a time when Mao attacked Confucian ideas, erased them with revolutionary fervor. So today, nostalgic for tradition and eager for rehabilitation, public discourse has situated Tibetan medicine in a politically favorable climate to regenerate tradition and expand medical practice and scope, though still forcing physicians to walk a fine line with religious practice. So by 2019, when we saw Qinghai province procure um, national funds to apply to state um, allocated facilities, they were able to build and staff Soripa facilities, as I mentioned earlier, at every administrative level. So this has now provided an access to healthcare provided by Tibet medical institutions to autonomous regions, more so than its biomedical equivalent. Before 1950, Soarikpa was virtually the only form of healthcare on the Tibetan plateau. So redeveloping Soarikpa so that it features centrally as the primary healthcare system in Tibet, even expanding it beyond its historical reach is eagerly welcomed by Tibetan physicians and the communities they serve. This represents a distinct departure from decades of historical relegation of Tibetan medicine to inferior status and widespread Tibetan distrust of Chinese institutions and physicians that privilege native Chinese speakers and even Han majority individuals. So this proliferation of Tibetan medical institutions now provides a space for cultural expression, addressing community health needs and culturally sensitive treatments. So a crisis of confidence decades prior when Tibetan physicians questioned their competence alongside their biomedical peers has segued into engagement where today in the PRC, most Tibetan medical and education bodies work in tandem or full integration with biomedical colleagues through partnership and cross-training. Many Tibetan physicians gain insight into the weaknesses as well as the strengths of biomedicine and are able to emphasize Sorikpa's unique contributions, which I'm calling a rehabilitation of confidence. So the neuroscience research that has generated the insights on health benefits related to practices of Tibetan Buddhist expert meditators, derived mindfulness intervention, has also provided a confidence in the full scope of treatment that is part and parcel of Soarikpa's paradigm. Alongside China's Buddhist revival with mainland Chinese also seeking Tibetan Buddhist teachers, you can see this in Kat Hardy's work, um, published recently at University of Oxford Press. These influences give Tibetan medical professionals confidence to more openly discuss Buddhist practices in relation to medicine. Physicians now routinely recommend visualizations and compassion meditations even to their mainland Chinese patients. And such methods would not have even been openly discussed or advised decades ago. So as news of containment in Wuhan spread, Qinghai Provincial Tibet Medical Hospital reported on Xing's recovered cases accepted for post-recovery care at their hospital under their developed protocols. Dawa County reports also emerged on cases treated successfully with an integrated biomedical and medical, Tibetan medical care, making their physicians cultural heroes. And here it's important to recognize the bureaucratic context in which Tibetan physicians were operating in their own Tibetan regions in China and the distinct opportunity that that context 
highlights that we have here in North America. So any COVID-19 patient in China, including in Tibetan regions, has to be admitted to hospitals in which biomedical treatments are prioritized and privileged, even if traditional medicine was permitted. Each medical facility has various medicines that are permitted for use by that facility. And if it's a biomedical facility, it will have permissions to use biomedical pharmaceuticals, but not necessarily trad traditional medical pharmaceuticals. So those traditional medical pharmaceuticals that are permitted must go through provincial and or national licensures to get permissions for use in those facilities. The traditional medicines used in traditional Tibetan medical facilities also go through that permitting process, by which they can only be used at the facility for which they have the explicit permission. So one producer cannot necessarily distribute its product widely, say in these mass um, aid initiatives to many different medical centers without the med medical center having specific permission to use that formula. So this means that many of the hospitals um, using formula are using formulas that are made quote in-house, which come with of course some heterogeneity in the formulations, heterogeneity in the sourcing of materials, and then also the active potency. So nurse news circulated that only one of a thousand Tibetan students in Wuhan had confirmed viral contraction. And many Tibetans attributed this to this class of precious pills um, that are used for various chronic and intractable conditions. These often have 140 different ingredients of mineral and herbal um, contents, as well as precious gems. And they're often used for cancer, neurodegeneration, and these um, difficult to treat fever conditions. In India now, these have also become the frontline prescription for both preventative as well as treat treatment courses of COVID-19, although they haven't featured centrally in the Tibetan courses um, over use for the COVID-19 patients in North America. So amidst these reports, Dong Lanshan, go back one slide. So amidst these reports, Zhong Nanshan, who's the China's chief coronavirus expert, announced the National COVID-19 Research Committee's interest in Tibet medical approaches to mild cases due to the preliminary evidence of efficacy and potential insights from a history in high altitude hypoxic environments. And so one of the particular herbs of interest to Zhong Nanshan was the Tibetan plant Seidum, um, which is ephedra or ephedra sinica, the Chinese version of it, and a subspecies uh, as one of the highest surviving vascular plants at altitude. In Chinese, this is known as ma, ma huang. So Zhong Nanshan also knows announced a research collaboration with Chutin, this Tibetan medical pharmaceutical company, launching a 40 subject clinical trial in Wuhan using three of Chutin's national approved formulas. Consequently, a report recommended adjunct use of Tibetan therapies in biomedical hospitals to reduce mortality as early as March of 2020. So local plateau, plateau research institutions also received national funds to expand their related studies, particularly related to the Nakhul Pujar pill. So Tibetan physicians have skillfully navigated challenging historical conditions, including these points of potential erasure in, contem in contemporary circumstances regulating participation. So by mobilizing in this novel crisis context, they demonstrate an awakening tradition with an increasingly global integrated health landscape. And this is a, a, a presentation that was given by the head of the hospital in Dow County. And here we see that the cases are quite minimal in, in terms of the surges that they experienced. The most cases at one time was just nine patients. Um, breakdown was primarily adults in, in their population. Um, and a lot of what they were able to track in terms of data were um, the formulas that were brought online, the comorbidities, but because of these integrated uh, medical treatments, we couldn't actually parse a lot of this data. So this then set up the scene for us in North America to then consider our uh, opportunity to then um, look at Tibet medical treatments that had been exclusively applied to COVID cases. So um, these are our uh, physicians from Dao County who gave um, many educational uh, interviews with uh, various um, uh, medical uh, facilities and centers throughout the plateau to help provide education to the learnings that they had um, in those treatment cases. But by now we have um, doubled, tripled the amount of cases um, under Tibet medical care here in, um, the, in North America, in the North American context. So due to the limitations of not being able to treat patients exclusively with Tibet medicine in Tibet, our colleagues, uh, many of these at Dao County and also in Lhasa and Qinghai, 
um, had requested um, that we go ahead and launch a, a study of our own. Um, their idea was a randomized control trial, um, but a, a randomized control trial here in the US particularly requires many pilot studies and FDA um, uh, certification of the, the various investigative drugs to be able to be used. And there was no possibility for us to be able to uh, launch that kind of a, a study, but a case series study in which we could observe the uh, various treatments that were being implemented by our AMCHU was what we did end up doing. So um, my pharmacology colleague, Dr. Jim Nettles and I had wrote an article addressing this challenge in drug discovery and the need for these new methods to focus on network pharmacology and systems biology for us to get permissions to launch these larger scale research uh, initiatives. And part of that is uh, coming from a history in which HIV research has shown the ability to use cocktails as a synergy by design pharmacology to understand the minimization of selective resistance and the ability for us to bring together various formulas and have a synergistic um, effect that allows for the body to receive the compounds um, without this resistance. So my colleagues at the American uh, Tibet Medical Association, as well as the former research director at Mensikan, who's now at University of Minnesota, came together and decided that we had this opportunity to be able to launch this research. One of the contexts, though, is the, the challenge we have of our small-scale clinics throughout North America, where physicians are seeing um, patients uh, dozens at a time, not in the hundreds that we see in Tibet, and are basically relying on them to come in with their own diagnostics and to share those. So these were some of the struggles that we had and challenges in our research. Um, and at the early start of the outbreak, many cities did not have adequate testing and many moderate to even fairly severe cases were not admitted to the hospital. So we had quite a bit of heterogeneous data, some with significant outcomes. Um, and many that had um, ability to actually gain some of our diagnostics because a lot of our Tibetan community, especially women, are nurses in a lot of the ICU facilities that were treating COVID. So overall, we have 15 participating physicians in the study with 140 patient cases of the mild to medium severity presentations of COVID. And although one of our OMT in Toronto has 350 350 cases himself, he'll be publishing that um, with our institutional partner, Mensikang, the Tibet Medical Institute under the auspices of the Dalai Lama in this coming year. So our preliminary results um, have been able to show that the normal course of recovery for mild to medium severity cases on average is about 70% quicker. Um, so this is 10 days instead of the uh, normal course of especially mild cases of two weeks. So what we've been able to show, and this is linking in also with our colleague, Dr. Sienna Craig's work in tracking Himalayan and Tibetan community responses to COVID and looking at particularly, um, sorry, I'm a little bit behind, how the classifications of the cases were um, administered by the WHO. So we were able to actually look at oxygen saturation, respiratory rate for a lot of our um, patients, but we were able to look at the respiratory distress. So on classifying particularly by respiratory distress, we were able to look at um, our cases as um, centering in on the mild, medium severity cases. And that if you look at the conventional treatment for the COVID-19 cases, often it's no treatment. Often it is conventional guidance of rest, um, a healthy diet. Some also limit intake of sugar, highly processed foods and a balanced diet, hydration and non uh, anti-inflammatory medications as well. Um, from a Tibetan medical side, we have a similar focus on hydration with boiled water, but most of the dietary and lifestyle guidance focuses on the constitution and the comorbidities of the individual themselves. And then there's complex formulas that are brought online to help pull the patient through these various stages of the fever from unripened to the ripened, proliferating and empty fever as well managing the emotional uh, response to the infection, also the course of the disease, um, which is figures um, quite prominently for a lot of our patients during this time. The various decoctions that were used come from um, these small uh, formulas that are to condense the heat and bring down the inflammation. And then the other formulas are more of our complex multi-compound formulas, which are looking at a specific presentation um, for each individual patient. Um, supporting lung function, helping bring down systemic inflammation, cognitive and affective disturbances, supporting brain function, gastric disturbances, and so forth. So 
Um, as we've gone through, we've also been able to track um, the particular comorbidities that are more present within the Tibetan refugee population. So in general, Tibetan refugee population has a very large latent tuberculosis infection. One study in Montreal looked at 70% latent infections among the Tibetan refugee community there. They also have high hepatitis B um, uh, occurrences and then diabetes being a major um, outcome as well for or a major uh, comorbidity condition as well. So a lot of our cases were able to track then also this fast recovery rate, even amidst these uh, significant comorbid conditions, and also um, be able to show no hallucinations, that the cognitive effective sy symptoms were not prominent, also no long hauler um, symptoms from any of our cases thus far, and no hospitalizations. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pull to a close here and open up for discussion, but I just want to thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to any questions and comments that you might have. Thank you so much.